All right, peace and greetings, YouTubers. So the Alton Sterling situation, this is something that's just so... I don't even know how to word this because I'm at a point where I'm just so numb to all of this because it just happens so frequently and so consistently and it's just such a redundant occasion that takes place every day in America. It just hurts my heart, you know what I mean? Like, I'm at a point where I'm almost desensitized and not desensitized as in I don't care, but when these things happen, I'm like, oh, another day in America, good old America, it's just, a re it's just another Tuesday, you know what I mean? Like, it happens so much and I'm just at a point where it's like, man, I... I don't know, it, it, it just, it, it drains you, and because it happens so much, you get to a point where you don't even have a reaction anymore. Um, I just remember how outraged and just how much my blood boiled when Trayvon Martin's stuff happened. Like, if you see my old Trayvon Martin video, I was in my feelings and effort, cussing out everybody, just couldn't even get my words out, I was so mad. And, and so four years later, uh, uh, you know, a few thousand Trayvon Martins later, <laughs> Yeah, it's like, what? Well, what's next? You know, and so I'm at a point where I can't even sit and focus on my outrage anymore. I'm more so focused on what is the solution and what's the next move? What are we about to do to, to seem with this thing? Because the issue with these police killings is so much greater than just the individual police killing us. It's something, it's, it's the tip of the iceberg to a larger spectrum of a structural system that's screwing us over. I always say that in a lot of these videos about the structural system screwing us over, but if you don't understand the structural makeup of this country, then you don't understand anything, and that's something you have to research and read up on and get acquainted with. Because once you understand that there are institutionalized policies and systems in place that set up this country to be the way it is, then you understand why the world works. A lot of people look at people like me and some of these other bloggers and stuff and think we're crazy radicals and we're just lunatics. We're not. We just understand how things work. So when we open our mouth to say a lot of things that people are afraid to often say, it's not us trying to, to, to start a war, it's us trying to wake people up and say, like, listen, you need to be aware of what's going on and understand that this is our reality and this is what's affecting us. So getting back to my point, I'm at a point where I just need us as a community to really recognize and understand that sometimes our energy and focus is in the wrong places. Like, I personally don't believe in trying to explain myself to white people anymore. I honestly don't. Like, at the end of the day, we don't have to explain anything to them because they are not going to get it. They're just not. The reason why is because they're protected by that same system that screws us over. They benefit from a system that oppresses others. So when you get that benefit of something, it's hard for you to understand and empathize with the struggle of someone like me because it seems like literally they can't even fathom half the things that we're explaining to them because they just can't even imagine a world where things like that happen because they've never had to experience that. And that's why I always tell people when these things happen, first of all, we need to stop asking and, and begging white people for our own liberation, our own liberty. We have to just go and take it. I'm sorry, we really just have to go and take it because they're never going to give it to us. We can march all we want. We can sign as many petitions as we want. We can do as many press conferences and kumbayas and call all the little public leaders to go and do whatever speeches they want to do. But at the end of the day, no one is going to protect us but us. I don't put my energy into any of these political candidates, even as much as I love Barack Obama. Oh, I love the story of Barack Obama. It just warms my heart to see, you know, a black first family in the White House. But at the end of the day, Barack Obama is just the face of a structure that still oppresses us. Nothing against him personally, but he works into a system that screws us over. And as much as he would love to help us, that system is like, hell no, you, uh -uh. listen, I know you're black and we let you be president, but that's where it stops. You're not going to be doing anything for black folks because this system doesn't work that way. So you can forget about it. So, you know, that's literally the way things are. There's a system that screws us over. So we have to stop always asking and demanding of white people or demanding white people to give us our liberation because we just honestly have to take it. They will never give it to us. That means they have to give up something that benefits them. And so, I don't know if y'all ever just think about how powerful we are as a community. Like, you have to think about, black people have been giving the short end of the stick with everything, everything. And when you look at how resilient we are and how talented we are, that scares the mess out of people. Like, just think about that. You know, I, I'm sure people are like, well, how the heck? I, there's a system in place that makes sure that people that look like this go to the worst schools, have the worst hospitals, have the worst food, live in the worst neighborhoods, have high crime rates, get affected by drugs and mental health issues and everything like that. How the heck did this black person end up being in charge of ABC, the entire network? How the heck did this black person become president? How the heck did this black person... How, how are they so talented? They don't even have arts in their school. How are all the best singers black? Sorry, they are. 
Okay, I'll let y'all have Celine Dion. She's cool. But I mean, how are all of the best entertainers black? Because when you look at the background of where they all come from, most of them come from nothing. They come from destitute situations where it's just like, how did you make it out? And not only make it out, but make it out and be the best at what you are. People hate Serena Williams. Why? Because Serena Williams is the best tennis player in the freaking world. And she came from nothing. She came from a system that screwed her over and statistically she should have 13 or 14 kids. She should be on welfare and she should have five or nine different babies' fathers and she should have a record. But somehow she's beasting on everybody in these tennis competitions around the world. Like that baffles people. And I think what gets, getting back to my point, I think it freaks people out. So when we talk about these police, especially these white male police officers, I think there's an element of inferiority, of, like an inferiority complex that they have with us. They believe that it's a superiority complex where they think they're better than us, but they recognize that if the tables were turned and if the resources were equally allocated the way they should be, we'd run this country. I'm sorry, black people would run this freaking country. Like, literally, we have the skills to do that. We have the talents, the intelligence. And so people continue to make sure that they keep us pressed down because they know once we rise, it, that's it. Like, once we shine at something, we not only shine, but we clean house. And that scares people. And I think that's why it's so easy for us to always be killed. And that's why it's so easy for people to vilify us. Because if you continue to push that kind of sensationalized viewpoint and ideology, it continues to help support the narrative and the structure that oppresses us. You know what I mean? Like, I think that's what that is. So uh, you, you look at just the way that this world works and the things that are aligned for us all suck. It's just a terrible setup for us. And somehow we still keep pushing through. And so that's why I'm like, we have to learn to organize. And I really think group economics is something that is so powerful because money is what talks. We can't keep banging white people for liberation and these politicians and everything. One, I'm going to say this. Every politician is bought out. Every single one of them. They're all bought out. A lot of these community leaders are bought out. A lot of these public figures are bought out. It's something that in order for us to get to where we want to be, where we have the rights of everybody else, we have to go and take it ourselves. We have to go and make those things happen. And literally, there's only two ways for revolution to happen. One, your money talks, or two, bloodshed. Now, we're, in my opinion, we're not a violent community. We're really not a violent people. We're very warm and open-hearted. Like, we, black people are accepting of everybody. We take everybody into everything. And that's why we always end up becoming the victims, because we're so trusting of everybody. We teach people all the things that we learn, and then other people go steal it and, and, and exploit us, and then we end up having to work for them. You know what I mean? But we're not a violent people, so probably we're not going to be doing too much bloodshed. But that's why I say affect commerce, affect revenue finances. That's what speaks. Like, if you look at Congress, Congress is not, oh my God, they're all the scum of the earth, each and every one of them, to be real honest. Like, example, John McCain. John McCain will never, ever utter his mouth to say anything about gun control, anything. Why? Because in the last 20 years, the NRA has given John McCain over $7 million. He's bought out. He will never stand for anything. And that's literally how all these Congress people are. So when we're going out of our way to go and protest and we stand in front of the Ray Byrne building and we go and stand in front of the U.S. Treasury Department and we're doing all these different marches and stuff, those people don't care because they're bought out. Somebody has bought them out. They're not going to go against the status quo of what's giving them wealth. That's why we learn to use our money, our money talks. We have a trillion dollars worth of buying power. Picture if we allocated that wealth to things that were important to us. People would start to listen. The reason why we're always the last priority with any politician, they'll pander to us during the election season. You know, they'll go and go to like Hillary Clinton, go to the black churches and this is the day that the Lord has made. I don't feel no ways tired, you know, doing all that bullshit and everything because she knows all she has to do is just tickle, tip, you know, tickle us a bit and say a few little black pro things, get us excited, and then that's our vote. And she ain't gonna do shit for us when she get in office, okay? Um, that's literally how politicians work. So we have to learn to let our money talk. Money is what gets things accomplished in this country. This country doesn't operate off morale. There's no morals in this country that operate and, and, and run things. You know, like, people don't do things in this country because they feel bad for others. This system will not be struck, strategically taken down because black people finally felt bad for it, or white people felt bad for black people. That's why I laugh when white people are always, trying to quit this, are always quick to try to say some stuff about, oh, but white people died so you could be free during the Civil War. No, the hell they didn't. And I said this in another video, but let me just make this real quick. If you honestly think... 300,000 white people died because they felt bad that black people were slaves. You are an idiot and you need to go read.
because that's not the way any of that works. So go do your research on what the Civil War was really about. That whole entire war was about economics. Yes, slavery was the main portion of everything, but slavery, it wasn't about the actual treatment of the slaves. It was more so what revenue those slaves were bringing and how it affected the economy of the North versus the South. It had nothing to do with whether or not people felt bad for the black slaves. So I need us to understand that our money talks and it, we need to use it in a way that gets things done. Um, and I just feel bad because I feel like the mental health of black America, we deal with so much. Like, mentally, we are so strained. Like, our existence is like a, a game of Jenga, like the Jenga blocks. And it's like people just keep pulling from us. And as they keep pulling, our foundation on the bottom just gets weaker and weaker and weaker. And as they pull from our foundation, they put more hardships and more challenges on top of our structure. And so, 400 years later, after you've dealt with slavery and Jim Crow laws and the black codes and, and sharecropping and, and all of the terrible things that have done numbers on us, we're on this little shaky foundation and we're carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders. And when that final foundation collapses and everything just, you know, falls apart, all hell's gonna break loose. And so I always try to tell white people, like, y'all keep playing and acting like y'all want to be colorblind to our issues. It's gonna affect you in the long run at some point. So I suggest y'all just go ahead and get on board and, and check your privilege. But my thing about it is, like, the mental health of our country, we just... And I'm talking about black people, I ain't thinking about everybody else, but the mental health of us as a community, we, we're dealing with so much. It's hard to walk in the shoes of a black person. This is why white people don't understand our struggle, because no matter how many facts we give, no matter how much we talk about our experience, they'll never feel it right here. You know, they'll never know what it's like to turn on the TV and see somebody who was a part of your community be shot down and killed and then watch them be vilified by the media and watch the police jump out and say some nonsense story because that's the other thing. People think we're stupid. I don't know if I already said this in a video if I did, forgive me. But, like, when you look at what happens when these situations happen, it's always the exact same cycle. The situation happens. The story gets out, people are outraged, the police give us some bootleg recollection of what happened. So it's usually something like, oh, he reached for my gun. You know, it's always a scene on Mission Impossible or Die Hard or something. He, he reached for my gun, I feared for my life, I had to shoot him 29 times in the face. And then turn him over and shoot him a few, few more times. Then get in the police cruiser and run over him a few times because I feared for my life. And it's kind of like, when you look at the background of what really happened, it's like, okay, this person had an ounce of marijuana or something like that. And you mean to tell me, somebody who had an ounce of marijuana, something that would have only been the equivalent of getting like a little misdemeanor in some community service and probably not any jail time, was really going to risk their entire life and try to kill a cop and get a murder charge over something that they would have never went to jail for in the first place had they just cooperated? You honestly think that's what's going on? Black people are not reaching for your guns. They just... They, there is a system that protects these police, and they know that they're protected. Like, you look at the state of Florida. I said this in another video before. Since 1985, 1989, there have been over 600 police-involved killings with unarmed individuals, and only one of those police have been charged. I don't even know if they were actually convicted, but only one of them have been charged. That's the system that protects them. They know they're protected, so they can say anything. That's why they can go and say, oh, this individual killed themselves in our police custody. And I'm like, you mean to tell me... This individual had, they, they, you didn't like how they signaled or they had a broken tail light and th that charge was just so atrocious that they went and they hung themselves in a jail cell, really. You mean to tell me that this individual who was handcuffed in the back of a police cruiser somehow had a gun and shot themselves in the head, even though you should have frisked them before you put them in the police car? And even though the reason that they got arrested was for a marijuana charge, I don't think so. They think we're stupid. So, and then the next element is after they've insulted us, because the, the insulting part of this specific case with the um, story I'm talking about now is they're saying the body cams fell off. Oh, both of the body cams fell off, both of the police officers, and we just, you know, there's no other angles. And I'm like, well, y'all got dash cams. And it's okay because we already recorded this from two other angles because there are two people, you know, standing by that recorded it. So y'all can save the narrative. So after they insult us, then they get somebody in our community to go and be the puppet. This is usually the, a preacher or, or, or somebody who is toxic. And I don't mean to call preachers toxic, but I'm speaking about toxic towards a movement. Because what they go, they go and they say the same rhetoric. They go in front of the, the, the cameras, they do the speech about not all cops are bad cops. So I'm kind of like, this is like an argument about having a barbecue with a gas grill or charcoal. You're still going to get burned by the flame either way. So they go and do that whole speech about not all cops are bad cops. We need to just be peaceful tonight. Everybody go home. Let the judicial system do its thing. We'll be okay. And then they get everybody calm because people put their trust into these people. And half the time, they're bought out themselves. And then... The next part that happens is nothing happens. Somebody does not get charged. Or if they get charged, they don't get convicted. And then the cycle starts over. So it's kind of like 
People just need to understand that this system screws us over and we as a community, we really need to stop giving these toxic people our energy. And it's not just these preachers, because there are some preachers who actually do work in the community. Like I think, like in like the DC area, I really like the Reverend Tony Lee guy. He really actually does stuff in the community. And he's very outspoken about what happens within our community. And he has no problem calling people out as he sees it. But going back to what I was saying, like another example, somebody toxic, Wendy Williams, Whoopi Goldberg. I don't like to do videos where I bash my own people, especially black women, because I'm very protective of the imaging that black women are, are given because everybody has it out for them. But in my opinion, they're toxic to our movement. Um, time out. Okay, I got a little bit of time. All right, um, I think somebody like Wendy Williams is toxic to our movement only because, you know, I, I, I saw what was circulating on Twitter today. And my thing is, she was responding to the Jesse Williams situation where Jesse Williams went and he talked about the structural oppression within America. And because white people somehow make everything about them, whenever we talk about anything structurally regarding race, they can't seem to fathom what we're talking about because once I said, they're blinded by that lens of privilege that protects them, so they can't understand and fathom what we're talking about. So they automatically take everything personally and they think when we're talking about a structural system that's racist, they think we're talking about them individually. So they went and made this stupid petition and got like 17,000 um, signatures and somehow Wendy Williams had the nerve to, to e e equate white people being pissed off about us talking about a structural system and somehow tying that to the fact that it's racist to have historically black colleges and it's racist to have something like the NAACP and what if they were historically white colleges. Stuff like that is toxic and because what happens is Wendy Williams has an audience and because she is a black woman when she says stupid things like that white people will latch on her and say well Wendy Williams said it and she's black or whatever and, and this that and the third and then before you know it people think that those ideologies are okay. Whoopi Goldberg is another example. Anytime you watch The View and they say anything regarding race no matter what the issue is, Whoopi is going to find a way to give white people the benefit of the doubt in the situation. And my thing is, white people don't need our protecting. They have an entire system that protects them that they benefit from. They will be okay. I promise they will. We don't have to keep taking bullets for white people because they don't for us. Okay? It's nothing against them individually. I have nothing against white people individually. I have an issue with whiteness in the system that protects whiteness. But the actual individuals of society who just go and live their daily lives, I don't have an issue with. I have an issue with that system that protects them and the whiteness that they hide behind when they want to do some foul stuff. That's what I have an issue with. And Whoopi doesn't seem to get that. So when we have these toxic people that go and they break their necks and say, oh, what about the black on black crime in our community? How come we're not outraged about that as well? Toxic. Because if you are under the impression that we can't be outraged about both things, then you are toxic. And I've already done a video about black on black crime, and I will just post a little annotation if you want to see that. But literally, I'm not having that conversation tonight. So we need to start working towards those solutions. I really, really want people to understand group economics. I think is our first step. Let our money talk. Learn to boycott. And I don't mean boycott for a day and do a blackout. Oh, we're not going to shop on Black Friday. Yeah, that's right. Let's not shop on a day where everything is cheap and then go shopping the day after where everything's full price and they get all their money. No, I mean blackout like we don't buy anything for a year. Years. Months. Not anything. We don't support a whole lot of different things. Like, I mean, you have to let your money literally talk. In order for revolution to happen, it not only takes time, but it takes consistency. And people are going to have to be uncomfortable. And until we can get to that state, these things are going to continue, continue to happen. This system will continue to screw us over. Until that system is infiltrated, gutted out, and flushed out, and replaced, we will always have these continuous situations where we're being killed by police, where we're not being tra treated fair on the job, where there's unfair housing, but our voting rights, are, voting rights are being seen with. We're living in food deserts. Things like Flint, Michigan water can happen. That's going to continue to happen until that system is flushed out. So until then, we just need to learn to expect that this is going to be our reality. So my question for you is, what is your next step? What are you willing to do? You can go and march and protest all day, but when you get home, what happens next? You know, that's my two cents. Anyway, I need to go to bed. Um, share your two cents in the comment section. And, we you know, I really, really feel for that boy. Like, I just, I feel his pain. Like I said, like, my father died like a year ago. And I just, to see that boy feel the pain of losing his dad, I just, I can feel it in my, like, it just... It was deep down in my spirit. I will pray for that family. It hurts my heart. But the next question is, what's our next step? So that's what I think all of us should be pondering on. Anyway, I'm out. Subscribe.